Welcome to the Tech Story Podcast, where storytellers kibitz about technology that makes us go, hmm, what's that about? Now introducing your host, Doug Thompson. Sit back, relax, and enjoy part two of my interview with Bob Ferguson, rocket science and speaker coach. You mentioned earlier about failures, Mm -hmm. but my role was in strength and stiffness. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was a structural engineer and I used to love breaking things. It was never the objective, but I used to love breaking things because if you don't break it, you don't know what you've got in reserve. Mm -hmm. If you break it, you know exactly where you are. Yeah. Now, it's not always a, a popular view, but I used to think that when we'd finished the test program, the best thing we could do was go on and test it until it failed. Mm-hmm. And then you've got a hard point in the ground. You know what fails first and when it fails. Mm-hmm. So uh, Th- then you, you would know, have to repeat I, that to make sure that it failed at the same place. Right. To get sort of the large sample size. But it, yeah. it's it's true. Uh, you know, and if we go back to the mind and speaking is a lot about mindset and in the, in the, in what you, you know, taming that inner voice and making it work for you, excuse me, is that we totally underestimate what our capabilities are a lot of times. Um, You know, sometimes we have, there's ego and stuff comes into play, but the normal person has that limiting belief of why I can't do this. And and you talked about it earlier when you were saying these meetings are terrible, but I really wasn't motivated to do anything. Well, I guarantee everybody else in the room was thinking the same thing. And but their view of it may have been, well, I can't impact everybody else, as opposed to you just simply, well, I don't like it, so you were avert, uh, uh, avoiding it. So how do you how do you work with people that have sort of that same thing? Because because I find that that's the thing. Well, I can't do what you do. I said, well, you're exactly right, but you can do you a lot better than what I can, and I can help you get there. Yeah, I, I think people have to see a that it's it means work. It's like any sort of progress. It takes work to do. It's not one of these things where you can fit a module in someone's head and they go away a better speaker. They have to be prepared to go out and try it in the workplace. And you have to encourage them to see the benefits that it will bring to their career. And in fact, whatever they're feeling, I will remember what they're feeling. And I can tell them that they don't have to feel like that. They can Mm. feel confident in front of an audience and they can express their viewpoint. The most, for me, the most critical point is that they have great value in their heads. Mm-hmm. And if they fail to get it out, then the organization loses and they lose. Mm-hmm. So you really want to encourage them to see that by expressing their viewpoint succinctly, clearly, and with confidence, then everyone benefits. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a lot of engineers, a lot of the scientific people I talk to are more concerned about impressing their peers or what the what the people that sort of think like them look like again that's that's not necessarily the most useful discussion for the company or, or even for them and, and i'm trying to show them the value of yeah you you were well respected within your nerdery clan we'll call it. Yeah. <laughs> but you got so much more potential that you know say say marketing we were talking about they they have a different mindset they think differently they have different needs how do you help them understand that hey if you did this and we could market this here's a whole other product line that you could have you know i think how do you get them to to value more than simply how they're respected against with their peers how do you get them to sort of get out of that that uh yeah belief i think the first first thing i have to do if if it goes towards marketing is to make sure i never mention the word sales because as soon as you mention the word sales, yeah. the, the technical breed back <laughs> off and think this is not for me. You know, this is some sort of subversive activity that I shouldn't be involved in, uh, such is the, the image that people often have of sales. They have tremendous power in marketing. Mm-hmm. And I think if you can encourage them to be an ambassador for the company mm-hmm. and to show that by helping the client reach the best decision, they're using their expertise to help both the company, the client and themselves. Mm -hmm. So they have to see the value in what they do and and how they can impact on decisions that people make. Yeah. Sometimes when I talk to these, the, the, these, again, the fellow nerds is, is they want, they want that proof that, okay, well I can do this and and it is sales. And, And I will distill it down. I'll borrow a little bit of stuff from Dan Pink 
in that yeah. where the to sell is human. And I say, you're selling already. And they say, no, 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 I'm not. Then I'll, I'll go through and we'll come up with an example. Okay. You were on a team and, and you, you know, you were competing ideas and you ended up, you know, getting them to come to your side. Yeah. Yeah. That happened. That's sales. <laughs> you sold everybody else in the room that your idea was better. Yeah. So, well, so, certainly they have to learn to be persuasive. They have to learn to use the elements mm -hmm. that will provide persuasion. Mm -hmm. And I think you also have to show them that this is is not a manipulative process. Mm -hmm. That what you're doing is not persuading someone against their will, mm -hmm. which would be ethically yeah. bad. Yeah. But but good sales mm -hmm. is about finding the right solution for the client. Mm -hmm at the right price in the, in the right package mm -hmm. that suits them yeah. and that they have a very active role to play in that. And that without their role, it's quite possible that the client would make the wrong choice. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, that, they're a very important link in that sales chain. Yeah. That, that's my, my, my role is a, is a pre-sales nerd. I like to call it. That's been my role my entire career. And this yeah. is where Jules, you and I really sort of uh, are, are on the same page in that I don't look at it as I'm selling them something. Or, you know, sales has got this bad thing of, you know, hey, here's something I really don't need or don't want, and I just want to want your money. And But it comes back to, I see that you have a need, and there's some value and some stuff that our product can do for that, and my my goal is to unveil that, to explain yeah. that. here's and make They make the decision to then, they, this is worth them parting with their money. The worst feeling that I have is when somebody has purchased something, a product of ours, and then they don't go do something with it. Yeah. You know, for me, that is, that makes me feel bad. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that's, that's good sales. And uh, I know you will have enjoyed your talk with Jules, but she's very heavily focused mm -hmm. on what she calls unique human mm -hmm. proposition that everything is about a human relationship. And I think mm -hmm. if you can show technical people that it's about building a relationship based on trust with a client, mm -hmm. then they're far more willing to take part mm -hmm. than if they think they're going in to persuade them against their will. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a little dopamine that goes along with that when you've actually hit that. Right. So there's, there's a payoff reward there, even outside the, the financial enumeration is that, Hey, yeah. I've made a connection with somebody and I've made their life, better for that and ultimately yeah. at the end of the day for me that is my goal in life is to make the world a bit better place than it was before i left um you know the the goal of it is not to to you know i, I get i have some people that when they get into sales technical sales for the first time they're a little well i've got this quota and they focus yeah. on this big big asset and all my career i've said look if you're doing your job the number takes care of itself. Don't you let that as the motivator is, is that you want to go out and help people use your product because it is, it fills their need. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, they have to play um, a role. I think with technical people, a lot of them have introvert characteristics. And so in fact, going, being this outgoing person who builds relationships, if you think of the archetypal salesperson, mm -hmm. Who, who's part of this big gregarious group and selling and hail fellow well met and all that sort of stuff that doesn't always sit well with technical mm -hmm. experts uh, they they are poor often at small talk and they don't want to spend this time building the small talk so it's about showing them how all those bits contribute to building the relationship that in the end will allow the client to trust you. Mm -hmm. And when the client trusts you and you give them good quality advice, you're not selling anything. They're buying something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that, that's a whole other angle to look. And that's the way it should be is they're buying something. You're not selling something. And there's been yeah. times that I've said, I hey, look, this is not going to be a good fit for what, you know, you, you may think that you want yeah. this or you've heard and it's not going to do what you want it to do. And I don't, I, you know, I'm not going to sell it to you. You, know, I, I, you, know, you can't buy it because it's not going to do what you want it to do. But here's some alternatives that may help you accomplish that. Yeah. And, and that's the sort of attitude that builds strong trust. Mm -hmm. Because whilst they may not buy your product now, mm -hmm. the fact that you've advised them that it's not the best product for them and that there are other alternatives that are better, mm -hmm. 
will mean that when they see the opportunity, they'll come back to you because they now trust the advice they're going to get from you. Mm -hmm. And they know that if your product isn't right for them, you're not going to sell it to them. Yeah. And sometimes, so you, you know, <laughs> no, it, you're right. It does. Cause it's like, but sometimes it also uncovers a latent need or something that they have that, so they sort of misframe what they think they need to solve. They didn't, you know, they misidentified the problem and yeah. through that saying, Hey, I'm not going to, and here's why. And, and we go through some more discovery of what the un, real underlying need is. Yeah. And we find something else that totally does what they want to do. So, so the knowledge that a technical person has of what the product capabilities are that, and if you marry it with the an understanding of the business value and, and challenges and stuff on that, that sort of gets in this area where you and I talk about that's this area where we're, we're sort of playing and, and trying to, you know, how do you, what skills or what would you, <clears throat> when you're coaching some of these technical leaders, I'm sure some business discussions and value things come up. What are some techniques or, or guidance you give them to sort of understand that this other side of the equation that needs to balance? I think the first skill they need to build is build is listening. You've got to be a very attentive and active listener so that when the client's talking about your problem, you've got to keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper. Just what you said starts off, they're asking for something and often clients don't know what they want. They do not have the engineer's prototype uh, mentality. And so instead of building a prototype and trying to get it to work, and once it's working well, saying, well, I need something that does this, and then coming to someone like you and saying, can you deliver something that does this? What they do is come and say, oh, we have this problem. What have you got that will solve it? And without the deep dive, you're unlikely to find the right solution. I think it's often a shame and i know with some big systems it's impractical but it's a shame there isn't a prototype approach where you can say to a client why don't you give this a try for a month and see how it works if it works well for you you can buy it if it doesn't work we'll look at why it doesn't work and find something better for you and i think if companies were more open to helping people through that process then they'd probably end up with more sales in the end no, I, I think you're right. And it, it, there's a prototyping proof of concept stuff. And, and when you go to an as a service model, there's actually more of that going on now because there's yeah. more at risk if you're doing as a service because you've tossed infrastructure and everything else that was working for you in, in doing this. But it's helping, you know, part, again, the listening and the questioning piece of that is so that, one, you fully understand what their problem is. And sometimes as they're describing the problem, it's not what they re originally formulate. You're helping them clarify what their need is, you know, because, yeah. because, because a need and a problem are not always the same thing. You know, it's, it's, and it's getting clarification on what that is. Yeah. I, uh, questions are a very powerful weapon mm -hmm. for you when you go in, if you're going into a company and they're asking you to present, to provide them with some piece of equipment or some service, mm -hmm then the best thing you can do is have a question and answer session mm -hmm. because by doing that, you will uncover what they're really looking for rather than what they've told you they're looking for. And, and that's the ultimate, if we'll wrap this up and sort of come back around to the communication and a lot of the failures, like you mentioned the metric to, to the, to the uh, Imperial or English, uh, whatever we still do over here that the rest of the <laughs> world doesn't. Um, well, you don't, don't everywhere. Yeah. Well, but but it's it's the it's that communication piece of that and and if if we go from the point of instead of talking at somebody you want to talk with somebody and get a, there's there's a uh, you know at some point in time I need to ask you questions to sort of get where you, where you're at and along the line as I'm asking questions I'm also as I'm listening to you as you're questioning me I'm also sort of getting an alignment with where you're coming from and maybe help clarify that so it's very much being open to that exploration of which we, you know, we're old enough to have done this before texting and everything else where we had to talk to people and we had to do things because, you know, you didn't have all this uh, easy ways to do it. And it's something that you and I uh, absorbed over time just naturally because we were exposed to it all the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. How, you know, a lot of my stuff is is nurture. And I'm not sure how naturally I absorbed it. But what I did do in the early days, because once you become a speaker, you, you love to talk. Mm -hmm. 
but when I was having virtual conversations with people like this one, up in the top, I would have a chess timer. Have you seen the chess timer with the two clocks? Uh, yes. If you, if you play chess, mm-hmm. you, you make your move and stop your clock and start mm-hmm. the other person's. And, and if you run out of time, you've lost. Right. Uh, I used to have a chess timer up on the top. So when I was speaking, I would click my clock. And when I stopped and they were speaking, I'd click their clock. And I'd look at the ratio between mm-hmm. the two. Because if I was talking over 50% of time, this was bad. You, know, you want to be listening as much as you can. So, And I used to use that to develop my skill of not talking too much, speaking, extending the conversation, working out where the next question was, and then shutting up and letting them talk and explain it. So I, it was a great little tool just to try and limit the amount I spoke. You know, I... Um... You, you hit upon something that's very close to me is, is and I've said this before. It's, it's sort of funny when you said this, this is, this is a wow moment where <clears throat> I thought it was unique. My goal is to talk less. So if I go into a meeting, I don't, I have sort of a, we'll, we'll call it a virtual timer in my yep. head yep. that if I'm, again, if I'm, if they, if the, my customer or the person I'm talking to talks more than I did, then the meeting was, was as, 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 should be as, as successful. Excuse me. I can't talk. <clears throat> she is successful. Ah. <clears throat> Man, somebody talks for a living. That's that's bad. <laughs> was it successful as it could be? So it was just funny that you pulled that up, that you actually had, being an engineer, I could see you actually having to have a clock. Me yeah. being just somebody that likes to talk, I sort of keep a virtual clock in there. But that is true. If if you're yeah. talking, and that's the, as a podcast host, my guest you know, is to make you look good, so I shut up. I just sort of tee up something and then let you talk. Yeah. And, and you're right. You build that. The, the, I hardly use the clock nowadays, but the purpose of it was to make me focus on how much I was talking compared to how much then. And, and you've built that into your head. It's come into my head now because I worked with the clock in the early days mm-hmm. and it makes you think about what you're contributing to the conversation and how much you're really getting to the root of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the phrase less is more, often more is very true with this. So uh, as we wrap these things up, I know you've got a, you have a book and it's second, second printing rewrite. What's, what's, what's going on with that? It's in its second edit. Now I I wrote it. I did the first edit, which was all the grammatical stuff and making sure that it flowed reasonably. Uh, And now I'm into the graphics edit. So I'm putting in all the graphical images in the right place and making sure they're okay because the text hopefully won't move. It'll go out to its, reading audience mm-hmm. it's trial reading audience very shortly and then i'm hoping that march will be publication date and what's the what's the title it's called great technical speaking it's not rocket science <laughs> i love that and if you need an extra <laughs> test reader i, I send, send me a copy i'd be happy to sort of go in because it, it sounds like something i'm gonna buy anyways but, that would um, be fantastic. I'll, it, I'll send you a copy to draft read. That would be cool. Brilliant for and it's not rocket science. Otherwise, I couldn't do it. But I mean, you're obviously a trained rocket scientist. So, I mean, you know, that's oh. that's a whole different thing. But it, it is it's very rewarding once you sort of master this and, and it's it's squishy and you'll be uncomfortable and you'll but and you'll have so much fun. And, and I, I was talking to a coach friend of mine the other day and she put up this you know, poll, how do you want people to leave after they've talked with you? And it's informed, blah, blah, blah. And I was immediately drawn to the word energized. So I I think anytime, and I'm energized after this conversation with you for sure, but anytime that you leave and the audience leaves energized, they're more likely to take action on something that you've done, that you've covered in there. So that for me, that's, you know, what I aim for. And I would certainly say to anybody when I was talking earlier about the more perhaps introvert characteristics mm-hmm. of technical experts is that this is a completely learned skill. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be natural. My wife likes to take the Mickey out of me because she knows where my roots are with the uh, introvert side. Yeah. And then when she sees me at events and I'm talking to people, she says, Oh, you know, were you connecting with people there? She, <laughs> she thinks I try to avoid it. Uh, but the more you do it, the mm-hmm. more you learn that you can do it. And mm-hmm. and I think probably what technical people learn is that it is a valuable part of the conversation. It's the part 
that begins to build the relationship. So it's not trivial and it's not wasted mm-hmm. time. It is the building block of a stronger relationship later. And yeah. it's a completely learned skill. You can learn that. No, you're right. I mean, it's learned and it, it, it's the worst thing that can happen is you're sitting, you know, 20 years down the road and says, look, I had this great idea. I had it solved in my head and it stayed there and it died. How many, how many things cures to problems that we have and all these other things are residing in somebody's head right now that you don't take it to the grave with you. We need to teach you to get it out. And that's why skills that you teach these people are invaluable. Yeah. It's not just bad for them it's a shame for them that their ideas didn't get out Mm -hmm. but it's poor value for the company Mm -hmm. because they have great value in the insights they have to offer Mm -hmm. and if you don't get those out of them then it's wasted and you've wasted the value of employing them okay well well, thanks for thanks what's the best way to get a hold of you Uh, the easiest way is to email me it's bob at bobferguson.co.uk well cool and you, you've got a LinkedIn page and all on that. And we'll put those things in the show notes. And yeah, that would you, be great. Thanks. I, I love the conversation. I appreciate the, uh, this just, we're so much on the same page. And Jules was right. We would hit it off. Uh, with, <laughs> we're on a very much the same mission. And what I, my ask of you is, hey, send me a reminder five or six years from now, you know, if you, so we can do the countdown of like two weeks to where we can oh, see yeah, if you okay. separate. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll put it in my diary. All right, cool. Well, thanks a lot, Bob. That's a pleasure. Nice to speak to you, Doug. Take care now. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tech Story Podcast. And it would really be helpful if you'd go out to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast and rate it. You know, give it a five star because it helps other people find the podcast. It really raises the visibility. It would mean the world to me if you would do that. <laughs>